anytime. From anywhere in their nationwide network. 500 minutes for $50 a month from Sprint PCS. Commit a murder and you can go to jail for life. Maybe even lose your life. But how about killing not one person, but 1.7 million people and getting away with genocide? In Cambodia between 1975 and 1979, the Khmer Rouge killed one out of every four Cambodians. And incredibly, only now, 20 years after the crime, these master criminals, surviving leaders of the Khmer Rouge, are being captured or turning themselves in. What will happen to them is being decided as we speak. And even more incredibly, one very real possibility is nothing at all. We decided to study the question of justice for genocide through the eyes of two American citizens. And in fact, our story begins in Lowell, Massachusetts, where one third of the population traces its origins to Cambodia. Seng Ti, a guidance counselor in a middle school, is about to return to the homeland he barely survived. So is Arn Shorn Pond, a social worker and a musician who plays for the ghosts of the killing fields to bring peace to them and to himself. They agreed to let us tag along. In Cambodia itself, you don't see the ghosts, not at first anyway. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a land this serene. Every time the sun rises or sets over the Mekong, it sketches an ode to tranquility. But the peace, profound as it seems, is deceptive. The dead and their spirits are everywhere. It reminds me when I was a, a little boy. Sang Ti was about seven years old when he and most of his family were put on these trains. And I remember we were so exhausted. People were packed in this car, and I couldn't even breathe. I had to stick my head out um, to get some air. And it just reminded me of the uh, Jewish you know, Holocaust. The Nazi death camps had names which no one will ever forget. Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Treblinka. Have you ever heard of Trabang Sva? This is Trabang Sva, and Cambodia is littered with hundreds of places just like it. There's a mass grave everywhere here, the whole place, the whole damn place here, the whole... Arn Chorn Pan, the flute player, has come to revisit his childhood, a trip back in time with no nostalgia. I lived here two years out of four years. Arn was about 10 years old when the Khmer Rouge ripped him away from his family and put him in this temple. And they kill like three times a day, and uh, some, sometimes four to five times at night, and, and, and um, sometime in the middle of the night. Sang Ti lost his father and mother, as well as seven brothers and sisters to the Khmer Rouge. This is his first trip back to the village where he was orphaned. I think yeah, this spot. You think, think it was yeah, here? Yeah. To this arid, unmarked spot where he dug a shallow grave for his mother. Yeah. The Khmer Rouge dropped her right at the end of this path, yeah. right by, the, yes. right by yes. these bushes. <laughs> Why don't I leave you alone here? We're less than eight miles from downtown Phnom Penh. The fighting has been going on here for two days now, and the Cambodians are getting badly hurt. Ten kilometers. I was one of the journalists reporting how it all began, how the Americans exported the Vietnam War to Cambodia, destabilizing the old regime, bringing it under fire, first from the North Vietnamese, then from local communist insurgents who called themselves the Khmer Rouge. Civilian casualties were not announced, but it was another case of destroying a village in order to save it. When the Khmer Rouge took over in 1975, the world couldn't imagine what would happen here. Like other engineers of genocide, the Khmer Rouge were driven by a dream of purity. They wanted to cleanse Cambodia of its corrupt city dwellers, so they emptied out the cities. They wanted a pure peasant society, 
So they killed anyone who was educated or looked educated. Everyone else was enslaved in work camps or communal farms, but the only crops were famine and terror. The most difficult for me was the smell. I can smell it right now, the smell of the, the blood and the dirt together. The, Arn Shorn Pan took us to the place where he and the other children were kept. There's, there's some blood stain in here. I, I, came, I came last time I saw. The Khmer Rouge didn't waste bullets on their victims. Adults were killed with farm tools, usually. Sharp blows to the back of the head. Children's heads were broken in more primitive ways. They took the head, they put the head right into the wall, and they hit the head like that. The blood spread like that. I remember it. And, and these still are not... This is the blood here, I'm sure. This black, dark here. Here, the blood, blood. I probably cannot and will not forget it because I, I, I dream, I have dream. Even, even, even now I have a dream about this place. And probably I have to live with it for the rest of my life. I don't, I'm surprised they, 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 there are many people come here now, they don't clean the place up. Yeah, this is the house. Sang calls it a house, it was a hut really, where he and his parents, professionals from the area of the capital, Phnom Penh, were imprisoned. There's 30 people in that house, but only one left that house. This is where they took my father. You saw them take your father? In the middle of the night. What did your mother tell you? Uh, not to, not to sh cry, not to show emotion. Because if you showed emotion, maybe they'd kill you too? Yeah, they killed my mother, they killed, they killed me. One year after Sang's father was killed, his mother starved to death. He didn't have food to eat at all. You were alone. Alone. 30 Just... people alone. I was the, the last one. <laughs> Aside from the Khmer Rouge cadres themselves, there is no one in Cambodia over the age of 20 who is not a victim. Almost all the same story. Kek Galabru is a human rights activist who's documenting experiences of women survivors. She doesn't want to write a book, she wants indictments. <laughs> Most of women lost the husband, lost almost all children. Some had eight children and then all the children die and they live here without uh, nothing. With so many grown-ups killed, with almost his entire family wiped out, how could a child like Seng survive? You told me how the other people died, but how do you explain the fact that of the 30 people in that house, you survived? Do you think that has any meaning? I think I was the bravest one in that house. The which? Bravest. You think you were the bravest? Yes, because I knew I'd rather just to go, just to get killed with a full stomach. So I had to sneak out at night to go and steal food. You weren't going to die like your mother? I'm not prefer that way. I prefer they kill me with my, with the, full of stomach, full of food in my stomach. I prefer that way. Miraculously, this lonely little boy with big ears made it through jungles and over mountains to a refugee camp in Thailand. He was eventually adopted by a family in the United States. Sometimes they just do it here, right? And Arnchorn Pond? He was also adopted and brought to the States, but almost everyone he knew back in that temple is underneath this orange grove now. Arn is alive, however, in part at least, because his captors wanted entertainment. They chose five kids to, to play music, and I was the number one, and the other one kid was number two, and the rest is number three, number four, number five, gone to the orange field. So you played music to survive? I just played the flute for them here. I got famous. They gave me a little more food to eat, and they, they were not killing me. Not many got out of that temple alive, neither did prisoners from this former school in Phnom Penh, the nation's capital. 
Of the 20,000 who passed through here, only seven survived. And there was a ritual. Every victim was tortured before being put to death. Today, the prison is a museum. Paintings of the process, photographs of the prisoners. Yeah, this is one of the uh, famous photographs because you see a child that she's holding while taking a photograph. Yuk Chang lost much of his family during the massacres before he escaped all the way to Dallas, Texas. We just don't want to put a photograph and had and post a question mark for them, but we want to explain, want to tell them the truth, what happened. He has returned to Phnom Penh to dig up documentary evidence, which he'll turn over to prosecutors if and when there are prosecutions. Now, one minute, these are, so it's, and is that a fingerprint? A sand print of the prisoner. After they confess, they force or they ask the prisoner to, to confirm all this statement. Now, one minute, let me make sure I understand mm -hmm. this. This is, this was written by the interrogator? By the prisoner. This was written by the prisoner? Yes. And it's his confession? Yes. Obviously obtained after torture? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And tell me basically what the confession says. Uh, the confession basically um, tell about the history of the prisoner and how they were involved with the party and how they betrayed the parties and how they speak other languages, which is the wrong thing. That's a crime. That's a crime. To speak a foreign language. Exactly. Uh, or drinking water without permission, or so having sex without permission, or talking to a friend without permission, they're considered as a crime. From there, they justify of their killing to the prisoner. But why would the leadership care whether a prisoner had drunk a glass of water, or had sex, or had done something against the rules? It doesn't give them any intelligence. It seemed to me that they want to purify the society, including your brain. The brain must be pure, must be clean, must be obedient to the revolution. You know, I'll tell you what shocks me. I mean, we, we, we knew quite a bit about the Khmer Rouge. Yes. We knew they were killers. We knew they were sadistic. We knew they were brutal. I did not know they were bureaucrats. They're very bureaucrats. You know, without this file, we cannot convict the Khmer Rouge leader. We convict them with their own file. The files confirm that the genocide had been meticulously planned by the Khmer Rouge leader, Paul Pot, long before he took power. He put it all in writing, a Cambodian Mein Kampf. It was his death last year that inspired some of his lieutenants to turn themselves in. Others were captured, and they could all be brought to trial next week. They're not hiding out in the jungle anymore. They're right here. Across this minefield, just on the other side of that tree line, there's a, well, it's a housing complex, a very nice one. The residents are two surviving top leaders of the Khmer Rouge, totally unbothered by the government in Phnom Penh or by the world at large. What happens if you try to pay them a visit? Let's give it a try. Gates open. Oh, gates closing. The men we wanted to drop in on were Kyu Sampan, the nominal president of the Khmer Rouge, and Nguyen Chi, the ex-prime minister. They surrendered Christmas Day last year to the Cambodian government. Instead of slapping them in jail, however, Cambodia's current leader, Hun Sen, welcomed them as lost brothers. But they didn't make us feel welcome, not at all. They don't want to man. Sorry? They don't want to film. They don't allow you to go in here. We can't go in? Yeah. We, we just want to visit and have a chat with the gentleman. They're moving back to Batambong now. In Batambong, they told us that they're here. They told us we should come and visit them here. That's what they said, man. After five minutes of arguing, armed guards told us to get lost. Thank you. Soon after these guys handed themselves in last year, government forces captured two of the most infamous Khmer Rouge henchmen. They're now in jail in Phnom Penh. But why is it that the movement to prosecute them and the others is being spearheaded not by the Cambodians who suffered at their hands, but by the United States, which has Cambodian blood on its own hands? The answer in a moment.